Hello there, I'm Owen Murray here with the Excuse to Learn podcast today. I'm joined by Joe Krasnowski, and in a minute we'll be joined by our very first guest on the podcast. John Strong, announcer for Fox Sports. He called the World Cup final game, so we're just so thankful to have him on the podcast. Awesome, we're so excited for you to hear that. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at ExcusePod, and we'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome back to the Excuse to Learn podcast. Once again, I am Owen Murray here with Joe Krasnowski, and we're so excited today to bring on our first ever guest. He's a University of Oregon alumni, works for Fox Sports in soccer commentary, and recently called the World Cup Final in Qatar. Today we have John Strong on the podcast. How are you doing, John? You know, you guys are already learning. This is this is being able to uh, have a series of things you're dealing with that the people who are listening on the other end have no clue about. And they're all confused of why I'm bringing this up. So it's it's a pleasure to be on with both of you guys. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. So we know so much about you, and obviously you came and talked in our class. But could for the uh, listeners at home that aren't quite as familiar, can you tell us a little bit about your backstory and what's brought you to Fox Sports? Yeah, born and raised in Portland. Went to the University of Oregon um, 20 years ago that I was a freshman, which is kind of crazy to think about because I don't feel that old, but uh, I, I'm getting there. Um, and then, yeah, I was able to sort of leverage opportunities at the University of Oregon, um, working at the campus radio station, calling games online, um, you know, made some connections that allowed me to start working in radio in Portland, start working as the the Portland Timbers local announcer on radio and television. And then Timbers went to MLS and getting on the radar of, of both Fox Sports and NBC. And I've now been with Fox for over a decade and uh, called a couple World Cups and um, you know, have been able to, even though I don't, I still feel young relative to other broadcasters. I am quite young relative to other top broadcasters. Um, but I've been around enough, been doing it enough that, you know, I've been able to build a nice little body of work. But um, yeah, being connected to the University of Oregon is still super important to me. And, um, you know, it's, it is kind of funny to think back sometimes. You guys can't see, but where I am in my office, I have lots of different trinkets and memorabilia and um different things of sort of these reminders of oh my goodness the amazing things that that i've gotten to do in the you know less than 20 years since i left oregon and obviously you grew up in america grew up in portland but what kind of drew you to soccer it's, it wasn't the top sport it still isn't the top sport in the nation yeah i mean i was nine years old well, i turned nine during the 1994 world cup and that was that was a really important moment um you know mls launching two years after that um you know one of the big moments for me was my 13th birthday getting a nintendo 64 which had fifa 98 and the road to the world cup that was the first fifa video game that was really mass produced in the u.s and gained popularity um you know it is funny to, to speak to guys your age because a lot of these reference points were before you were born you know but being able to have as I was in middle school was when the internet was really becoming a thing. You could actually kind of follow European soccer and having in 2001, when I was in high school, the Portland Timbers were reborn as a, back then it was called the a league, um, the division below MLS, my senior year of high school, we were able to get a, a digital cable subscription. I, I twisted my parents arm for that. So we could get what was then called Fox sports world. And by the time of 2002, I was able to, I, I think soccer caught my attention in a variety of ways, partly being from Portland. Soccer was kind of a thing in Portland. People remembered the Timbers even before they were reborn. The University of Portland was a big college program, both on the men's and the women's side. Um, I had a dad who traveled a lot internationally for business. And so he would bring me back soccer jerseys and you know, he remember once him telling me when I was in like second or third grade, he was watching a game on TV in Italy and the goalkeeper came out and kind of like slid into the opposing player to tackle the ball. I started doing that in like rec soccer. So it was around <laughs> me, even though, yeah, it was not nearly the thing that it is today. Um, but I always say that by the spring of 2002, following European soccer, being able to actually watch it on television on a regular basis. And then when that World Cup happened in 02, my junior year of high school, it was, in fact, um, I it was in South Korea and Japan. So the games were on overnight. So the last two weeks of school, I basically lived a nocturnal life and tried to keep my eyes open in class because I was up all night watching the games. And that was kind of my, by 02, 
it was my life. It was everything to me. Um, but it is, it is interesting to think I, I come from an era and a generation where those things kind of happen in real time and it, and it grew in real time around us. And it is neat to think back now of over the 20 years since the incredible ways that the sport has continued to grow and become much more of a normal thing than it once was where I would wear, you know, soccer jerseys to class and people would have no clue whatsoever what any of it was um, and think I was a giant weirdo. And I probably was a giant weirdo, but, you know, it's much more normal now. That's totally funny because, I mean, I grew up on FIFA 11 and, you know, FIFA 12, that kind of stuff. And I grew up with the 2014 World Cup and the Sounders uh, became an MLS team in 2009. It's it's all kind of turning over the same way. And obviously yeah. we have the World Cup coming here in a few years, right? Do you think that that can have kind of this, a similar impact to your World Cup? Oh, yeah. That's going to, you know... 94 is interesting if you think about it soccer for all intents and purposes didn't exist in this country in 1994 it was a decade after nasl had folded the soccer that did exist in this country was indoor soccer and there were some places you know there in the 1980s the the uh, cleveland steamers and uh, indoor soccer team outdrew the cleveland cavaliers so indoor soccer had some popularity in this country but outdoor soccer and certainly access to european soccer didn't exist in 94. In fact, I'll, I'll phrase it to you guys this way. The first time I can remember watching, ever seeing soccer on television, because I played soccer as like a kid, would have been pre-94, like early 90s. And the first regional cable sports network, it was called Prime Sports, was on in the Northwest, what became Fox Sports Net Northwest. And they would air games probably from England. And it was probably on like a, you know, a tape delay. And I thought it was so weird because I would watch these games. Okay, that's soccer. But they would keep playing through the commercial breaks. And that was really confusing to me. Like they come back from commercial and the score would be different. I'm like, what kind of weird thing is this? Not realizing that they didn't take commercial breaks in soccer. But American TV would insert the commercial breaks. One of the things, if you ever go back and watch games from that 94 World Cup, they make a big deal about today's game is being brought to you commercial free by. And they list off like eight sponsors. It was literally the first time soccer had aired on U.S. television that they weren't inserting commercial breaks on. If you watch the NASL games from the 70s, they would air on CBS, and they'd insert commercial breaks, and they'd come back from break and show a replay of what you missed, and that was just kind of the thing. So 94, it was massive, but it came from a complete wilderness. And so now to think about 2026 – and where soccer is now and the popularity soccer has gained and the types of TV audiences we've seen for these last two men's World Cups, to have it be in the U.S. and to have a U.S. team that I think at the very least will come in with excitement around it um, and with expectations around it. This is very likely going to be the biggest soccer event that any of us are a part of, whether we're fans or broadcasters or anything. Um you know, because it might be quite a long time before the World Cup would ever come back to the U.S. again. So um, it's it's special and exciting to think about what 2026 could be. And the fact that I have stand a chance to to play a, a role in it is is pretty cool, too. Yeah, you talked a lot about how, like, you can use your platform to be able to spread an, spread awareness and about about the sport. Could you talk to us a little bit about how how important it is to be able to use the platform that you have and be able to spread the knowledge of the sport through the world cup. I think any of us that work in soccer broadcasting, we, we understand that we're evangelists. It's a big part of the role. And I would joke about being the street preacher of Portland soccer, being on the radio in 2009 and 2010, especially in the evenings um, on what was then 95, five, the game. And, and I love the sport and I want to see it grow. And I also think other people would love it too. Like it's, it's, not self-serving as much as I think actually people enjoy soccer given the opportunity. Sometimes they just need to be given that introduction. And so I'd be on the radio at night and be kind of like me with my, you know, sandwich board on the street corner, knowing that if I could get people to come inside the church and give it a fair opportunity, um, they probably enjoy it. And one of my proudest days on the radio in Portland was the morning after the Timbers first home game in 2011. It was a Thursday night game. And the next day, all the people that would bombard us with text messages and calls during my show, basically like stop talking about soccer, please, for the love of God. Having seen what happened that first Timbers MLS home game, they were all, okay, that was actually pretty cool. You were right the whole time. And that was a very 
gratifying day. And so I do the same thing now of understanding that there's maybe about a million soccer fans in this country on a regular basis. If you look at the the audience numbers NBC gets for the Premier League, CBS gets for the Champions League, we can get for a, a good U.S. men's game outside of a World Cup. It's about a million people. So then when we're at a World Cup and it's now multiple millions of people watching a game or it's the 18 million who watched U.S. England on Black Friday and who watched the final between Argentina and France, okay, okay, that's 17 million people that aren't regularly watching but are interested enough and engaged enough to tune in for this. And so if I can get a very small proportion of them by just selling the joy and enthusiasm and getting them to understand and become emotionally connected to what they're seeing, even a small percentage, if I can get them, not me on my own, but just with what we're doing, to tune back in maybe next week or next year, that's a really cool part of the job. It's fun to be a part of something that, um, you know, if you're calling the Super Bowl, yeah, you're calling the biggest event in sports, but it's not like it's growing per se. Like it's already kind of the work is done. It, it's fun to be a part of what feels like a process um, with soccer and that you're kind of collectively all of us involved, um, you know, kind of pushing this boulder up the hill is, is a really neat part of doing this job. Does that change your style at all when you're presenting such an important game to such a great audience compared to what you talked about the 18, the many millions compared to just the 1 million on a weekly basis? How much does that change the style oh, yeah. that? We joke that if it's a Wednesday night FS1 MLS regular season game, we're going to goof off a little bit more and we're going to make inside jokes and references and things like that. Whereas when it's a World Cup game, when it's a big audience, we're much more mindful of if we are going to make a reference back, we kind of have to explain it, you know, and it's not being patronizing, but it's just, I'll give a great example because Stu and I were very deliberate about this at the last world cup. So when the U S played England, they changed when they were defending, they changed their formation instead of playing a four, three, three, which had been normally the case in a great Burhalter, they were playing a four, four, two, just to give England a different look and to match up in a different way. It was very effective. But what Stu did is instead of saying 4-4-2, all he did was he added four defenders, four midfielders, two forwards, added three words. But by doing that, a, 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 someone who doesn't regularly watch soccer who might not instinctively know what 4-4-2 means as compared to 4-3-3, it just helped them understand. There's just one more midfielder and one fewer true forward, just, just readjusting where the bodies are. Very simple thing to do. But what that does then is it makes sure someone who is not a regular soccer watcher doesn't feel left out. And I think that's a really important part of it, that it it can become easy sometimes to do things the same way, not realizing there's a different audience, and they feel left out by that. And that's not unique to the U.S., by the way. It's not unique to soccer. Um, Clive Tildesley gave an interview. He's he's a longtime broadcaster in the U.K., um, and he gave an interview once where he talked about at a World Cup understanding, even in England, that there's going to be people tuning in. This is maybe one of five matches they're going to watch the entire year. And and so can you make it accessible for them? Similarly, when you call the Super Bowl, and there's 100 million people watching. Regular season NFL games get between 20 and 25 million. So there's 70 some odd million people who did not watch the regular season are watching the Super Bowl. So how do you make sure they understand the story up till now? I think that's why they call it broadcasting. And I think being able to adjust our presentation for different audiences at different events at different times has been a big part of why um, our bosses especially have liked the work that we've done and have entrusted us with some of these big platforms. Awesome. And we call this the excuse to learn podcast, but what is kind of your biggest tip to people trying to break into an industry that it may be broadcasting or just, you know, sports journalism in general that you wish, you know, little John would have known. <laughs> I was lucky that I had really good mentors to help me understand it. I think there's a couple things. First of all, um, you know, there, there's a notion of the 10,000 hours of practice needed to become proficient in anything. So you two right now, um, you're very early into that clock, which means you're kind of terrible at this, but that's okay. That's normal. It's supposed to be that way. You need experience and something like broadcasting, especially or writing, you just need to do it over and over again. And, and it's that practice. It's that proficiency. It's finding your voice. That's how this is. I mean, I can listen back to the work that I did at Oregon and it's very rough and it's very raw. And I'm very early in my um, sort of my arc of figuring it out. 
but I can actually still hear little bits of what I do now that I was scratching the surface of then. So I think it's having the patience, understanding the long game, understanding there's it's a very competitive industry. Um, it can be very unglamorous at times for all the, the fun bits that can come. And there can be a long ways to go before you start to really feel like you're getting either positive feedback or that it's actually working. And so it, it, it's you know, it's become a buzzword in sports, especially in the last couple of years, trust the process. That's kind of what it is. Can you trust that your hard work is going to pay off, even if you're not getting that immediate um, satisfaction or feedback for it? If it's something that you really love and if it's really your passion and really what you're meant to do, um, then it's not going to feel like work anyway. If it does feel really hard and if it does feel very unnatural to be putting in the hours you're doing to be doing these things that maybe is a sign that it isn't meant for you, you know? Um, but again, some of it is also figuring out if it's really what you want to do. I was able to figure out very early, okay, I love this. This is like a drug. I want more and more and more. So at that point, it all became easy. The work was hard, but it, it was easy to motivate myself to keep doing it. I mean, you talked about how it can be unglamorous at times, but could you talk, obviously you've had some pretty incredible moments throughout your career. Do you have a favorite memory from covering the World Cup and that whole experience and being able to broadcast the World Cup final? You know, one of the things that happens when you do this is that the games themselves kind of blur together. Um, what you end up remembering is the stuff outside of the games. So even for the World Cup, it's been neat right now because we're, we're in the time window where it's exactly a year ago. So every day, you know, on social media, different places, you know, a year ago today, it was the Portugal goal that um, Cristiano Ronaldo didn't score, but he tried to act like he did. And I sort of vaguely remember that moment. What I remember more is more than the game itself that I called, it would have been this game that I had a very silly 45 second long soliloquy I inserted before the second half where I used a bunch of Portugal the man song titles <laughs> to sort of tell the story about Cristiano Ronaldo. It was very silly. It came to me like a few months before the World Cup and I wasn't sure if I was going to do it or not. And then a couple of days later, my wife sent me that Portugal the man themselves, someone had sent them the clip and they responded and they, they you know thought it was awesome. And I was like, okay, that's very cool. So the game itself you know, I only remember little bits of, but it's the stuff around the game and the moments, you know, with my friends and, you know, the World Cup final itself. One of the things I remember is after the game and we're walking out of Lucille Stadium, a place where we'd spent a bunch of time that month. And there's 100,000 people milling around. It's this, this incredible party atmosphere. And Argentina's just won the World Cup. And I remember saying out loud to our little group that was there, like, none of this will exist in a year from now and 10 years from now, which is kind of what we're seeing because ESPN did a piece recently where they went back and it just, this, we're in the middle of this incredible circus and then everyone's going to leave town. And it's going to cease to exist. And the surreality of that, I think is really cool of, of world cups are this incredible snapshot in time. And I try to work really hard to, to take mental pictures and memories. I have to my right here, a panoramic photograph I took um, from my seat during the national anthems of the 2018 world cup final and that's a wonderful little memory i have the game itself i only remember because i've watched the highlights back but i remember that feeling of getting choked up in the moments before kickoff because i'm like oh my god this is actually happening i'm actually calling a world cup final this is crazy so um those are the types of things that happen and that's where i say because there are very unglamorous moments to, to try to take those mental snapshots, you know, grab little bits of memorabilia to remind you of that. Also, the fact it might all go away tomorrow. Fox might call in tomorrow and be like, we found someone with a better voice and better hair. So you're out. And at that point, <laughs> you just have to sit back on, well, shoot, at least I had some fun, you know? Awesome. And then the last thing we ask people on this podcast is, you know, you've obviously had a lot of experience, but what's a project or, you know, a piece or something, some event that you're really looking forward to and you want people to pay attention to? 2026 is going to be awfully fun. And the journey that we go on in the next two and a half years with the U.S. men is going to be fascinating. And so that's where I'm really looking forward to this Copa America next summer. It'll be the next big test for the U.S., sort of building up over a period of years this arc to whatever they're going to do in 26. Um, I will say, as much as soccer is, is my thing, it's my passion, it's my love, 
the event I kind of look forward to each year is the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show. It's something I started to do in 2020 because I just, it was a random conversation with one of my bosses and she said like, what do you know about dogs? You want to do the dog show? And I'm like, heck yeah, I do. <laughs> and it's the most fun thing ever. And it couldn't be more different from what I do in every way, calling soccer games. But it's outrageously enjoyable and entertaining. And as much as it's easy to make fun of, and it's easy for people to sort of feel that it's silly, I've yet to find someone who actually tunes into the dog show, you know, just because I tell them to, that hasn't at the end, and been like okay that was actually really fun that was really neat that was it was kind of goofy but I, I really enjoyed that so um that's where as i say it's you know finding little outside things like that is really cool i'm really looking forward to westminster and it's mother's day weekend in may um you know but i also my favorite thing this fall honestly was uh, my wife and i coached our daughter's soccer team like that was actually super fun i was more emotionally invested in my daughter's and then my son was playing classic soccer for the first time. Um, I was more emotionally invested in that than anything else. So that was really fun to have that outlet as well. And that's something that, you know, it's a lot further down the road for you two guys. But um, <laughs> moments like that of things to look forward to, I think, is what's really cool about this about this gig. And then you find yourself in it and you just try to, you know, it goes by in a flash. That's the thing. World Cups, you look forward to World Cups for years and they go by in the blink of an eye. And then they're in the in the rearview mirror. And so trying to, in those moments, slow down and really soak it and appreciate it, I think is something I, I'm, I try to be very deliberate about. Fantastic. Well, you know, we can't wait to see the uh, Westminster dog show. We'll be tuning in. Exactly. Be tuning in 2026, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate you it, guys. Set. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for John Strong to come out on the podcast. He did such a great job, and we're really excited to learn about his story. Be on the lookout for a couple of our stories coming out. Owen will be in Vegas, and we'll have the duck season for the Pac-12 championship coming out. Never satisfied. A big, in-depth look into what Dan Lanning and his program have done to be able to get the, uh, the ducks to this point. Awesome. Yeah, and I just released the uh, Born a Duck. It's on the cover of Duck Season inside the Monday edition of the Oregon Daily Emerald, so keep a lookout for that one. Awesome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for John for coming on. For Owen Murray, I'm Joe Krasnowski. See you later.